houses, and they speak to one another. Everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes to the Lord. So they come to you as the people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. And it's scary because God is saying, listen, they come to me as my people. But are they my people? Are they listening? Are they obeying? Are they literally walking in my ways? And this is sad because we see God as concerned. We see God's concern about Ezekiel throughout the scriptures. And God looks if when we sing to God, when we worship God, well, if we mean it, if we obey it, if we hear it, and God is in the house of God. So I want you to understand, throughout the scriptures, it's, it's seen that God looks at his people. No matter what, God begins to see us. God sees who we are, what we are. I was talking to somebody just the other day. And I go, listen, when, when, when people just sit there and they don't sing to God, they don't worship God, they don't begin to uh, uh, respond to God, it just shows God a lot. I'm not saying you do things for show, but when I come to the house of God, I come to worship the Lord. I'm not caring about what this person is wearing, what this person looks like, what hair, her, her, his hair looks like. I'm looking to say, God, I want to worship you. I'm not concerned about who's not singing, but I am concerned about if I'm singing. And it's very important that we realize this, that throughout the scriptures, God begins to show you and I that he dwells among his people, that he looks at his people. Let me ask you, when God comes and God sees you, how does he see you in the house of God today? Does he see you yawning? Does he see you looking at your watch? Does he see you wanting to worship God, wanting to honor God? Does he see you having an attitude like, I can't wait, just shut up already. I want to go home and watch a movie. What does God see inside your life? Does God see you wanting to worship him? And this is why it's so important. As I was talking to this young lady the other day, I was saying, listen, it's important because when you're in the house of God, God sees if you're worshiping Him. God sees if you're paying attention to Him. Even the altar call is very, very important. It means you're responding to God. And as I was telling this person, the altar call is not just for a bunch of sinners that need God. The altar call is for God's people that are sinners saved by grace that need God inside their life that say, man, God, I'm not just coming here because, God, I sinned or I did something wrong, but I'm coming here, God, because I love you, God. I'm hearing the word of God. I want to respond to your voice God. The altar call, there's all kinds of things going on at the altar. Yes, some people are repenting. Some people are crying. Some people are happy. Some people are saying, man, God, it spoke to my life and thank you, God. But everything matters in the house of God. And I want to show you throughout scripture how God views and how God looks at things. We see in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 41, where Jesus looks at the people of God and he watches how people give. And this you don't hear a lot of people we're talking about, but it says here, now Jesus sat, sat opposite of the treasury and he saw, he says, I saw how the people put money into the treasury or to the offering. And many who were rich put in much. And it's kind of crazy, but you don't hear people thinking about it. But Jesus was watching these people give to the Lord. He was watching their attitude. He was looking at the intent of their heart. He was watching them begin to put their finances in. Let me ask you, when God looks at our life during offering or during giving, how does he look at us? And it's there that we begin to see that we see Jesus intently looking at how people begin to give. We see also another picture, and God speaks in the book of Isaiah 44, verse 15, as God speaks to the people in Isaiah's time. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he would take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindle it and break it, make it bread. Yea, he makes a god and worship it. He makes a graven image and falls down there to it. He burns part of it in the fire, and with the part there he eats flesh. He roasts the roast, which is satisfied, yet he warms himself and says, Aha! I am warm, and I have seen the fire. And the residue, therefore, he makes of God. Even his graven image, he falls down to it, he worships it, he prays to it, and says, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known me, nor understood, for he shut their eyes, they cannot see, and their hearts they cannot understand. And none considers in his heart, neither is their knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, I have baked bread with it upon the coals, I have roasted flesh and eaten it, I shall make the residue, therefore, an abomination. A nation, then shall I shall I shall I fall down the stock of a tree. And what and when Isaiah is saying and what God's speaking to Isaiah is deep. He's talking about how man is. He's talking about how man doesn't understand what they're doing. He says, man, they have no idea with the same wood, they begin to make a house with it. With the same wood, they begin to bake their food with it. With the same wood, they begin to keep warm with it. And with the same food, they make an idol with it. He goes, it's weird. It's off the wall. They don't understand. I see what they do all day long. I see how they worship images. I see how they warm themselves. Do they ever get the clue that I'm here? Do they ever get the clue that it's wrong? And he says, 
is powerful because He's followed them throughout their lives. But we don't realize that God's looking at us, that God sees us, and God is speaking to Isaiah. And he says, listen, do they even consider what they're doing? Does it ever dawn on them? Man, it matters how I worship God. It matters, am I worshiping an idol? Am I making things that are not real? Am I acknowledging who God is? He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He has everything inside of our lives. And it gives you a picture about those who make idols. That at the same wood, they cut down a tree. And when they cut down a tree, they make a house. They make a house out of that wood. Then they begin to bake food with that wood. Then they get that same wood and they put it in the fireplace to keep them warm. Then they get a little piece of that wood and they make an image or an idol. And they begin to worship that. And God's looking down and saying, hey, it's a no-brainer. What is going on with my people? It's here today that you begin to see that Jesus speaks to people in his day. In Matthew 15, 7 and 9, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy to you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouths, and honor me with their lips, for their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines and the commandments of man. And as Jesus is saying, listen, he's giving us a picture again of God's people saying, I love you, God. I honor you, God. You're the king of heaven. You're everything in my life. I'm saved. I'm born again. With their mouth, they show much praise. But their hearts go the opposite way. With their mouth, they honor God. With their lives, though, there's no action. There's nothing there at all. And I believe this new year, 2015, coming up, we want to be some action Christians today. We want to be some men and women of God. They say, this is not going to stay, but I'm going to live it. I'm going to walk it inside of my life. And you begin to see that Jesus is speaking and saying, hey, I see exactly what you're doing. He said, it's hypocritical to say that I love God, but your life doesn't honor God. It seems hypocritical to say, I I trust God, but do you really trust God? He's the Lord of your life. Is He God of everything inside of you today? And that's what He wants. He wants us to come to a point where we say, God, I surrender all. You are my God. You are the throne on my heart, God. You are everything and number one to me, God. Let me ask you, is He that in your life? God speaks to the people of Molokai today. He says this, and this have you done again. Look what He says, again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, and so much that he regarded not your offerings anymore or receives it with goodwill at your hand. Yet you say, wherefore? Or why, what are you talking about? God is saying, listen, you cry at my altar. Man, you weep. And, you, and it gives us a picture of somebody coming and like, man, God, I need you. And they're crying before the Lord. And God says, I don't want to see it no more. I don't want to hear it no more. In fact, I don't want to receive nothing from you at all. It's a scary thing. If God ever says, no, what? I don't want to hear you no more. What you do doesn't even matter to me at all. And God is speaking to the people of Monica and he says these words. Did you say wherefore? That word that word means like, man, what are you talking about, God? Man, what, what do you say? I don't understand. What do you mean that you're not going to hear me? What do you mean that we cry to you? We don't do these things. What do you mean that I'm just coming to the house of God for a show? Look what he says here. Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Yes, yet she is that companion and the wife of the of your covenant, of thy covenant. And it's here again that you begin to see that God gives us a look even deeper. The God looks how we treat our wives. God looks how we treat our husbands. God looks how we treat our kids. God's looking and says, man, you come to church all you want. That's a scary thing. To come to church and God says, I don't even notice none of it. You know, you might as well go home and not even be here. That's a sad thing. What are you telling me? I'm telling you what the Word of God says. It's crazy when you think about it. And then he goes on and says, let me tell you, I'm not hearing nothing you say because even the way you treat your wife, I'm not going to bless you. I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to answer none of your prayers. It matters how you treat your husband. It matters how you treat your wife. It matters if you just stop the blessing of God inside of your life. You got to look at her as a queen, huh? Queen of the house. Queen of all this, right? Same thing. Look at your wife. She's a queen. But then tell her, remember, remember, I'm the king. You, tell her. you see, I want you to think about because throughout the scriptures, you guys, Throughout the scripture, you see Jesus walking. You see him looking and observing churches, you guys. Throughout the word of God, you see that. Look what he says here in the book of Revelation 2 for the church of Ephesus. He's nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you've left your first love. And what I just want us to really get a picture of is that Jesus walks and looks around in the church. 
And, and, and the seven terms he's talking about there is not just for that time, but it's for our generation as well. That Jesus walks among the candlesticks. He walks among the churches of God. He walks and begin to see the attitude, the motives of our hearts. And the church of Ephesus, he says, listen, I have something against you because you lost your first love. I have something against you. And you offend me by the way you live your life because you put me second inside your life. Then you begin to read about the church of Smyrna. He says in Revelation 2, 9, he tells today, which is powerful. And all these he's talking to churches. He says, I know your works, he says, in tribulation and poverty, but you are, but thou art rich. And I know your blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And he begins to talk to every one of these churches. As he begins to talk to him, he's telling them, listen, I, you think I don't notice you? You think I don't see if you're real? You think I don't see these things? And, and he says, I have something against you. And he said, listen, saying, if you don't get this right, you're not going to make it at all. If you don't get this right, right nothing's going to be blessed inside your life at all. The church of Pergamos, he says, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a summing bottle for the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice the idols, to commit fornication. And what I just want you to see that over and over and over, you begin to see our Lord and Savior walking among the church. To the church of Thyatira, he reads in Revelation 2.20, Now with standing, I have few things against thee. Because you suffer the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed in the idols. And as he talks to this church here at Thyatira, he says, listen, I know what this church is doing. You think it's okay to, 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 to live with somebody and you're not married. You think it's okay to sit there and have sex and you're not married. Because you're teaching the same thing that Balaam teach. He goes, listen, it's not going to go at all. I'm not going to deal with this at all. And again, he looks at our motives. He looks at our lives. He looks at who we are. He says, I have a few things against you because you suffer the woman Jezebel. He says, you're believing a false doctrine. You're letting someone that says they're a man of God or a woman of God tell you it's okay to fornicate. It's okay to commit adultery. And it's wrong. But he's looking there. And he's listening. It is wrong. The church of Sardis, he says in Revelation 3, to be vital and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. And if you look at all these seven churches, you're, you're looking at something today that God notices us. You're looking at something that God begins to come in and out and God begins to see who we are. You begin to look at in church of Sardis, he's listen, man, you got things in your life, if you don't strengthen them, they're going to die. You're going to literally be left behind. The church of Philadelphia reads in Revelation 3 8, I know your works. Behold, I set before you an open door, no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. This is one of the churches that Jesus begins to promote. One of the churches says, man, I, I just want to say you guys are doing an excellent job. And I'm watching what you guys are doing in the church of Laodiceans. He says these words, I know your works. He goes on to say that you are neither cold nor hard. You're in the middle. You don't know what you want to do. You want to serve God one day. You want to serve the world the next day. You don't know what you're doing at all. He says, so then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hard, or you can't make up your mind, I will spew you, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say that I'm rich and increase with goods, have need of nothing, and notice not that I'm rich, visible, poor, blind, and naked. And it's giving you a picture of something like, I'm okay now. I'm good now. Whenever you think you're okay and you don't need God, whenever you think you're okay and you don't need instruction from the Lord, whenever we think that we're okay and I don't got to go to church, I don't got to read my Bible, I don't got to pray, you are poor, naked, blind, and wretched before God. And God is saying, listen, a real man of God, a real woman of God understands I need God every single day of my life. Without Him, I am nothing in my life at all. Amen. We see Ezekiel chapter, chapter 8 and verse 9. This is a powerful portion of scripture when you begin to look at it. Because this church is actually going out there and doing all kinds of abomination things. These guys were literally letting their imagination run wild. These guys were literally committing orgies down in the lower dungeons of the tabernacle or the temple. These guys were worshiping a God of Timaz. And then they were doing all kinds of crazy things in the house of God. And what's crazy about this is that God is literally walking around. And they saw Ezekiel. Look what they're doing. They had all their backs facing, uh, facing back away from God. And they were worshiping the sun god called Timaz. They were sitting there and God said, look what they're doing. They have no idea that I'm here and I see them. They have no idea what they're doing at all. They're, as, as you look at this, they had all kinds of infants everywhere. They're looking at filthy pictures on the wall. It gives you a picture of pornography. Probably one of the first, uh, not the first ones, but one of the greatest things you can see in pornography, even in the book of Ezekiel chapter 8, because they're imagining things. They're writing pictures on the wall that are dirty and filthy. And he says, listen, they think that I don't see them. Pornography is not a God. And people say, well, pornography is good because it teaches you things. 
No, that's demonic to the mass. How many of us demonic? Got to know that. Couples, everybody got to know that it's wrong. Pornography will tear your life apart. And the pornography killed all these guys. And you read chapter 9, you read that whole story that God went out and wiped all these guys out, killed them all. Sit down, six angels, and say, they just got busy on these guys. You see, you also see that God speaks to Amos in his day. In Amos 5.22, though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. You know what's even scary? We could be here and sing it. God's like, I don't even hear what you're saying. I don't want to hear it. Just keep it. That's a sad thing if God can say that. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice roll down like a water and righteous like a mighty stream. What is God saying though again? Oh, I'm not going to sing it because I, I got an ugly heart. No, get your heart right, then sing to God. But understand who you're singing in front of. And here God is saying again today that it's very important how we come to God. It's very important. And I was thinking about how we're going to enter this brand new year. And enter a year with expectancy. Enter a year coming to the house of God. Like, God, I want to worship God. I want to see God. God, I'm here for you, God. I want you to just deal with my life. Come my life. I want to worship you and praise you, God. See, it matters how we are. I thought about Jeremiah his day, Jeremiah 2.28. But where are your gods that you have made thee? Let them arise that they can save you in the time of your trouble. For according to the number of the cities are the gods of Oju. You know what's crazy when you read about Jeremiah's day? They were crying all the time. They were in captivity. They kept worshiping false gods. You might say, well, I don't worship no false god. Anything you put in front of God is a god. Did you know that? It could be your car. It could be your wife. It could be your husband. It could be your kids. It has to be God first in your life. For something that you go back and you say, man, I can't do that. First comes me, then comes family or my wife, then God. It's wrong. First comes God. That's what you have to understand. Then comes you. Because you have God in the center of your life, the first thing in your life. You'll take care of your wife. You'll take care of your family. You'll take care of yourself. Because you'll realize, man, God, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to offend you. I want to worship you. So in doing that, I'm going to take care of all that you have for my life. And it's here that God is saying something. He says, but, you, but where are your gods at? He goes, why don't, you go, why don't you stop coming to me and go to your false gods you go to? Go to the things you trust all the time. Why don't you trust your job like you always do? Why don't you trust your husband like you always do? Why don't you trust your wife like you always do? There's nothing wrong with trusting. But it's when you put that in front of God. How many know men and ladies in this place? Your wife can never be Jesus in your life. Husbands, your, your wife can never be Jesus. And wives, your husbands can never be Jesus. Sometimes a married couple is a wife wants her man to be like Jesus. To literally be Jesus, not be like him, but be Jesus. And you can't be Jesus. You can't be at all, man, I, I don't have what Jesus has. He has to be Lord of your life. I'm your husband. I'm the one that's going to help you, encourage you, and build you. Don't get me wrong, I got responsibility. But I can never, ever be your Jesus. That's where a lot of fights get in a lot of husbands and wives. So your problem is, is that I ain't Jesus. He's the Lord and Savior. You need Him. When you got Him, it's going to go all right right here. Remember, there's always a war this way, there's a war this way. Whenever you're fighting with your husband and spouse, then you're fighting up here, back and back, up and down. Then you go this way, you're going to go this way all the time. Your wife can never be Jesus, and your husband can never be Jesus. That's his job, not yours. See, today, as you look at this day, as we begin to look at this in Jeremiah 11, so do not pray for these people. Look what God is saying. Or lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. What has thou, my beloved, to do in my house? Have you done lewd deeds with many, and holy flesh has passed from you? When you do evil, then you rejoice. You know, again, God is looking at how people are in the house of the Lord, and how they live outside the house of God, and their normal conduct that they live every single day. And God says, why do you want to even come to my house for? Why do you want to even do this? You might say, man, you're going to lose a lot of people by saying all this stuff. No, I'd rather have people that understand the things of God. That's between you and the Lord, if you mean. But what I want you to understand and really realize today is that God looks at how we live our lives. I don't want to one day stand before God and go to hell. God say, you know, you're just a hypocrite. Man, you just act like I'm some genie or I'm some drug. You can just call me anytime you want. You act the way you want to act and live the way you want to live. You think it don't matter to me at all? I don't want to be deceived one day. And I don't want any of us ever being deceived. It's here that you begin to see the heart of God. It says in verse chapter 40, verse 11, it says, The Lord said to me, Do not pray for these people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by pestilence. And again, all this I'm saying, all this you begin to see. It's not about God's people. 
They're talking about the world. It's talking about God's people. It's talking about God's people. They don't understand who they're coming in front of. They don't realize that, man, God is a great God. God is the great I am. God is the God of the universe. God is sovereign. God is everything. They live and act and do whatever they want to do. What you're seeing here today is God is saying, listen, it matters how you live your life. It matters how you come in the house of God. It matters what you do inside of your life. See, in our text today, and you want to understand Ezekiel, who deals with the sins of the Jewish people. And God begins to give Ezekiel a reality of what the church is doing, but also they're doing with him, but also they're going to do with him, Ezekiel, as well. So we're reading our text here, and understand when you read this text, you've got to realize that Ezekiel's mouth had been shut for seven years. God literally shut Ezekiel's mouth for seven years, and he could only speak when God told him to speak. So you can imagine for seven years, can't say nothing. Only when God wants me to say something. So Ezekiel is uh, talking to a people that they have watched them, they've observed them, and he can only speak when God tells him to speak. That means that he can't speak his own mind. He can't sit there and say, you guys, what a beautiful day I think it is today. He can't say none of that at all. And then he opens his mouth in Ezekiel 33, and as he begins to open his mouth, he begins to literally have church, begins to talk to people, begins to have services in his home, begins to encourage people and so forth. But you read that in verse 22, Ezekiel 33, but when you read verse 33, it reads, As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and the doors of your houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. Now, the reason why they're excited, they're happy, man, is he can't have to talk for a long time. Let's come out, let's do this, and they're coming to the house of God. Now, I don't know how long they've been coming for, but God begins to notice something. God says, you know, Ezekiel, they come to you as my people. They're not hearing nothing you say at all. But he goes on to say, so they come to you as my people do. They sit before you as my people do, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart pursues their own gain. Indeed, you are to them a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice, can play well an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. When they come to pass, and surely it will come, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. See, this first of scripture is powerful, because God is watching them. God sees how they leave the church. God sees them at their home and they're gossiping or they're talking about people in the church or they're talking about their pastor or they're talking about the things of God. God begins to look and view everything they're doing. And it's in this that God begins to bring a shocker to Ezekiel and say, man, these people, they're not my people. You're, he said, let them tell them this. You're, you're, you're literally dealing, you know, talking to a people that are not even my people. You're literally talking to them. That's a scary thing for any pastor. Like, man, and God just said, let me show you who's really serving God in here. And how this place will be wiped out. And how many people will be standing. Would it scare us? Would you be here? Or would you not be here? It's fine. See, we got to get the whole picture of this. For seven years, God made Ezekiel to be a mute. And when he began to speak, and God began to allow him to speak. He only spoke, but God began to speak. But Ezekiel knew the people. Ezekiel they came to hear the voice of God. They began to hear the word of God. And these things today, is, you, when you look at this, you guys, it shows us literally just a, a very powerful thing that God is saying, listen, let me, as I look at this, let me show you what's really going on in the house of God. And I think it's a picture of our generation today. Because what they were doing, they were just coming in to check in. They are coming in, don't get me wrong, if you look at the, the heart of it, they're like, man, you guys, come out to church. They're inviting people to church. Man, come out to church, you guys. Man, God has something good for you. Well, it was nothing for them. They, they, they stopped the heart of God somewhere. They, they, they got religious somewhere. They got form, found new formality somewhere. They, they started coming in. They forgot who they're singing in front of. They forgot what the words were. They forgot, like, wait a minute, I'm coming because of God. And God, I want you to speak to me. God, I love you. And I think for us as being human beings, we got to almost remind ourselves that I'm here because of God. I got to simply give to God inside of me. God, I'm going to focus on you. God, I want to worship you. God, I want you to speak to me today in my heart, God. If anything, wrong, God. I want to get it right. I want to worship you and glorify you and praise you, God. Yes. See, this verse provides us a, literally a, a crazy indictment when you think about it. What was your attitude listening to God's word? The attitude was like, I want to hear, I want to hear what God says. <laughs> they had a habit. They, they knew they were supposed to go. And it's easy to get like that, you guys. Easy to go. Well, come on, you guys, get up. We got to go to church today. We got to go. <laughs> You come in and you forget what it's all about. It's easy to do that. It's easy to forget, you guys, we want to go to church today. Now you guys, God's going to speak to us today. Man, little Henry, God's going to speak to you today. Little Goobertron, God's going to speak to you today. You see, 
What's crazy about this is they, they were in habit. The Bible says that they literally did it usually, so they did it. It was a habit to come before God. It was a habit to listen to God. It, it was a habit, but they didn't put nothing to practice. They didn't put nothing to practice. They, they heard it, like, man, it's cool. It's great. So you got like a lot of Trinity going, like, yeah, man, that's fine, man. Tell me, yeah. But it was good. They were telling people, they were witnessing it, they were bringing people to the Lord. But what began to happen was there was no action in their life at all. They didn't practice the Word of God in their life. And it was the norm for them to come in and just listen to the commands of God. It was the norm for them just to hear repeated words of God. But it did have, it, they had no intention of changing their lives. They had no intention to say, man, God, I want to be a man of God. And that should be our heart this year. This should be our heart this month. Man, God, I want to be a man of God. If you're a man, you want to be a man of God. If you're a woman, man, I want to be a woman of God. What must I do, God, to be that man of God? Or there might be some things i got to do. I'm going to start listening, God. I'm going to start obeying, God. I'm going to start opening my word, God. I'm going to start praying, God, and worship, God. I'm going to start singing to you, God. I'm going to start worshiping and giving you glory that is due to your name. And that should be our goal today. And I want to be a man of God. I want to be a woman of God. See, what is the analogy to one who sings a song? They listen to God's word. They almost, you know, listen to the point they almost obeyed it, but they didn't. It was like entertainment for them. I remember a guy came to our church. He goes, listen, I'm not going to go to your church tomorrow. He goes, can I tell you why? I said, yeah, you can tell me why. He goes, because you don't got no light. I said, that's enough. I was kind of like, I never had my dad. He goes, you don't have all those sparkly lights that you wear. And I, 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 so I, I just went down and I said, all right. And I, I couldn't believe it. I just, I walked past him. Wow, man. Like, do you understand the word of God? Do you, do you come here? And he goes, well, that's why I'm leaving. And he hasn't been back since. He goes, I'm going to go to a church with all the lights. And all the just things going on. So, right. This guy was probably like at least maybe 48 years old. Pretty mature guy and looked mature. But when he told me that, I just thought, like, wow. So I guess some lights when you come back. I don't know. <laughs> but what I'm saying today, you guys, is that... They were listening to the messages. They were listening to the sermons. They were listening to the illustrations. But they had nothing to penetrate the heart that was going to change their lives. And I think today, I, and I know that I don't have the wrong message today. But I'm saying to you guys, if we're going to be lean and we're going to be fit in the kingdom of God, we have to change our perception how we do and how we come in the house of God. We have to change the point of, man, I'm not just coming just to come, but I'm coming to pay attention. You know what I look at sometimes? You can see people, and, and, and this is how it is sometimes. Everybody's singing, and everybody's worshiping God, and it's like this. You see, sometimes a lot of you do this. They're just like, everybody's singing, and you know, God. And I lean not on my own understanding. It's just like that. And I'm thinking like, man, do you understand you're sitting, you're standing, or you're sitting down in front of the king? You're sitting down in front of the king. If Obama walked in here, I guarantee you he'd get applause. I guarantee you, if your favorite movie star came in here, John Travolta, some of you older ladies. <laughs> 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 like, some of your, your, your most famous singers, Christian singers, should I say, forget about the worldly singers, you guys, you don't need that in your life. If you're listening to it, man, that's not going to help you. And you're listening to somebody singing about fornicating and adultery, they're not even married. It's wild. Anyway, that's a whole different topic. It's, Jesus would have said, they're like, yeah, turn it up. He wouldn't do it. Anyways, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> if, you're, if you're sitting there, and you see that sometimes, you see people that have no clue, they have no clue. And teenagers, you're big for this. But even some adults are big for that. You have to understand that, I, I can imagine God's like, what are you here for? You can at least open up that mouth and give me some praise. The Bible says if we don't pray, if we don't praise God, the rocks will cry out before God. You can let a rock take your place if you want, but I ain't let a rock take his, take my place. Even creation itself will change the rock to God. And when I say to you guys, if somebody don't mind if these guys forgot, man, that God deserved everything. That God deserves us in attention. God deserves, man, my heart to be focused. And man, God, I love you. And this is something we all have to learn. This is something you have to understand that when you come in the house of God, I'm not saying to put on a show. I'm not saying to scream. Some people sing like, and I lean on my own understand. That's fine. Some people are like, we're just going for it. Some people just move. I, I move my feet like happy feet sometimes. I'm moving all kinds of stuff. 
But what I'm saying is that everybody worships, but you can imagine God looking down like, you don't understand who I am. You have no clue at all. And this is what we have to understand, it, it, from the adults down to the teenagers. You're in front of a God that loves you. You're in front of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is what you have so many times. God says, I want to hear what you say. You should even hear just go home already. And that's a sad thing for God to say, like, man, why are you even here for? It's a sad thing that you can think just by coming to church it makes you a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian at all. It's like you, like the old saying says, just by you being in the garage doesn't make you a car. But you got to think about it, man, what am I here for? I'm here to worship God. And just say if I was in a bunch of little group that ain't singing, I'd be like, why are you ain't singing to God? He's good, man. You don't understand he's good? You embarrass the God? One day he's going to be embarrassed of you. But I ain't embarrassed. So watch me give my praise on it. Watch it. Watch it then if you want to watch it. But what I'm saying is, you guys, that's in your hearts. I'm not saying that you go, well, I can't sing you. God doesn't care about your, what you sound like. But God wants to be praised. During prayer time, prayer time is the same thing. Prayer is opening your mouth and talking to God, listening, but there's no way that God can even speak to you. He talks like this. There's prayer going. It's weird. Now, if you laugh, but think about how God sees it. I was like, check this dude out. Wow. It's weird. Not realize who in front of them. It's weird not to realize that God told these people, they're not even my people. They think they're my people, but they're not. They come to me as my people, but they're not my people. They hear the words, but they don't do them. They don't obey them at all. See, as I wind this down, I want you to know something, you guys. They, they even invited people out. They listened to God. They listened to the preacher, but they refused to obey what they listened to before the Lord. And the Bible says that one day we're going to stand before God. One day we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. It won't be how much Bible study you did or how much you learned. It'll be how much you loved and obeyed God. God's not impressed by what you know. God's impressed by what you do. He's not impressed by what I know this don't mean nothing until you do something. You can know anything you want to know. A parrot, you can teach a parrot to memorize anything. You can. But you can't teach a parrot to obey God. And this is why it's so important today that God told us, and they hear you, they seem attentive, they do all these things, but they don't put nothing into practice at all. And this word is so important for us to understand. They lack the joyful obedience to serve God. They lack the joyful obedience to grasp the whole of God. I was talking to somebody just the other day, and they go, what's the big deal? I'm in church. I go, the big deal is this, is that God sees you, and God sees that, you don't, that you're not caring for him. And it's not, because people, even young people, and even think, well, I'm not here to put on a show. Of course you're not putting on a show. But it should be real love. It should be real love. Well, I don't really know him like you know him. Doesn't matter at all. Get to know him then. There's no excuse you can't know him like I know him. The only reason I know him is because I begin to look for him. And I seek him like anybody else does. And when you look at this today, you have to understand that they were lacking in joyful obedience to the Lord. They were literally going through the motions. They knew what to do. They had the Christian walk down. Like, God bless you. How are you doing? High five, back five, everything. They had it all down. But there was something missing, and that was that they were not being obedient to God. There were several indicators in their life that they didn't have the spirit filled life. They didn't have the joy of God. They, they, they were discontented in life. They were there telling everybody, I'll say to God. They were coming to the house. And it's easy to do this. It's easy to come in like, man, pump me up. you got to pump yourself up. You gotta learn like, man, I gotta show the gift of God up inside of me. I gotta learn like, man, I'm gonna open the word of God. I have to open my mouth. And that's something that I learned when I first got saved. And, and, and what I mean by that is like, man, I, I, I'm in church just like you. I battle things. I, I wanna eat Chinese food right now. Like, man, I wanna eat Chinese food real bad. The only thing is, my wife doesn't let me eat Chinese food. So I'm confessing right now. So I sneak away to the buffet. Chinese buffet. I use it as an excuse. I take brothers and keep it out of It was all the way out, huh? Let me tell you what's going on. Man, God wants to know us. He really desires to know you. And I, and I say this to you guys, and I just wanted to let you know is that, man, God loves us. And I think, you know, I, I started realizing, man, early in my, in my Christian walk, when I came to God, God could either accept my worship or neglect it. Cain and Abel shows us that. Cain gave God an offering, and God said, I want your offering. Abel gave God an offering, he gave with his heart, he gave it his best. So God, God took him. So God could either neglect your worship, 
or he can accept your worship. He can even, man, I honor what you did today. You came to the house of God. He said, you should have stayed home. And we don't realize that. When I'm singing before God, there's times that food comes to my mind. I said, man, I, I, I don't want to think about food. I'll think about that later on. So I try to talk to me. Just say, if you were trying to talk to me, like, man, I need to get my praise on. I need to sing. I need to, I need to give God glory. That's why sometimes I sit in the front rows and I don't see nobody. This is how, how it is. I don't want to be distracted at all. I don't want to see somebody, look at somebody like that. Oh, God. <laughs> you don't realize, but if you're like this, you're just like, that's discouraging. Like, man, he's better than that. That's for sure he is. And what I'm saying to you guys today is that God looks at our hearts. God sees the motives of our lives. And all I'm saying today is these people, they came in as God's people, but they weren't God's people. Why? Because they access their heart. One that's remember that God knows the thoughts and intents of our hearts. The Psalms 139 verse 4. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh God. It may be possible to fool a person or a preacher or your wife or your husband or your sisters or your brothers, but you will never, ever fool God. And I believe that's why God told Ezekiel, so wouldn't, wouldn't sit there and make Ezekiel sad. But I believe that God told Ezekiel for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons I believe that God told him was to listen. These guys are coming here. I just want you to know the state of these people. They ain't serving me at all. They're in here for a show. They look at you like you're entertainment. They think you're a good song. They're here. They're inviting people all out. But they're not my people, Ezekiel. So you need to change the way you're doing things and start dealing with them a different way. And I believe that God told Ezekiel for all kinds. You can let your imagination roll on that. But I, can, I know that God told Ezekiel so that he wouldn't get heartbroken one day either. But that God also told him, Ezekiel, don't you ever get that in your life. Don't you ever think you just come to the house of God and check in and check out and think that I don't notice what you do. Think that you don't even deal with your heart at all. You see, James 1.21, I'm going to close with this one, 21 to 25. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the grafted word, which is able to save your soul. But be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man behold a natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goes his way, and straightly forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso look into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man should be blessed in his deed. And all I'm trying to say today, you guys, is that we not, not only need to mere listen, but we have to obey. And God says that whoever is not just a hearer, not a doer, deceives his own self. I don't want to ever deceive my own self. and think, okay, I came to ask God, I feel good. That's what people do. I feel good. But feeling good does not take the place of you changing your life. It doesn't change your place. Feeling good does not take the place of you feeling convicted and changing your mind. Repentance means to go the opposite way and change your course and go that way. And every time we come in the house of God, man, God's going to change your life. God's going to take you from glory to glory, from change to change. Even the altar call, I was talking to somebody a while back. They said, well, maybe if I would have went through the things that you went through, maybe I would appreciate God more. And I just go, wow. Think about that. If I would have went through the things you went through, too, then I would appreciate God more in my life. Now think about what that tells God. That's what a lot of people think. That's what a lot of church people think. A lot of our church kids think like that, too. They think, well, I didn't go through that. Didn't I? They didn't, you had to, because they don't realize. But does God have to bring you through pain for you to understand? Or... Can you start learning how to love God without the pain so you don't have to go through the pain one day? Amen. And if you think about that mindset, if your mindset is, you know what, man, I, I, I would appreciate God more if I would went through what you went through, but I don't want you to go through what I went through. Because by the grace of God that we were able to come out of that. But we should be able to love God for who He is, not for what we've done in our lives, or not because we have to wait for some tragedy to happen. Because if that's the mindset of some people's lives, and God says, well, guess what? Do I need to bring tragedy in your life for you to understand who I am? Do I need to do that in your life to do that? And all I'm saying today, you guys, is that we need to look at this. I think this, this brand new year coming up, and let's be a people that say, man, God, I want to honor you. And I want to see you. I want to put you first inside my life. I'm going to always serve an amazing God.